It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my very special guest is James Durham, and we're going to be discussing his book, Alert, Perilous Times, A Prepper's Guide to the Last Days. James, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that, Phil. Welcome, and I uh, really uh, sense that you're the kind of person everybody can connect with. I think you probably have a big following because of who you are in the Lord. Uh, Well, I appreciate those kind words. I definitely try to be approachable. Uh, fun fact, historically, I was very quiet and shy. God's, God's delivered me from that, and now I'm a lot more outgoing. Uh, and yeah, my, my goal with these shows is always to uh, draw, draw the gold, draw the gems out of my guests, if you will. And so I'll do my best to do that here as well. Uh, now, this is the very first time James and I are meeting. I know he's going to be new to a lot of you. So I definitely want to kick off our conversation by having you share, James, a bit of the James Durham origin story. For all of us meeting you for the first time today, feel free to talk about your special abilities, your superpowers, whatever we need to know about you. Please share that with us. <laughs> okay. My cape's not showing, is it? Okay. No, it's it's fairly well hidden there. <laughs> okay, great. Well, uh, I, I just uh, grew up in Oklahoma and uh, just, uh, I guess, in a way, an average guy, but I always um, experienced uh, seeing visions and things from the Lord. And I, I just always sensed that I really belonged somewhere else, that my father was a king and that my older brother was a great warrior, prince, and someday he was coming for me. And it turned out that little, um, little thing was actually true. So uh, I felt Father God came for me and G- Jesus came for me, my older brother. And uh, while I was in the university, uh, I was really, it was during the Vietnam War, and I was so focused on that. I was taking all kinds of extra training. And things to be a warrior, and I did. I didn't really expect to live past twenty-five because of what was going on in the world at that time. And so I was okay with that. I was focused on doing well in the twenty-five years. But then suddenly, in the midst of all of that, God spoke to me and asked me, "What's really important to you? What do you really want to do with your life?" And I thought of all kinds of things, you know, of wealth, power, <laughs> all of those worldly things, and then. I was getting nothing back from the Lord on those, so it occurred to me that what I really wanted out of my life was to be close to Him and to serve Him with all of my energy. So I, at that time, the Lord called me to become an army chaplain, and in my church, that was not a popular kind of thing to do, so they kind of wrote me off when I went off to war, as they saw it, but I felt called to love and bless and take care of military families. And I spent almost 30 years on active duty. I had uh, almost eight years in reserve time. And uh, one thing I knew is I love people. And I stayed there because I love people. And I was willing to walk with them in the darkest night and in the deepest sorrows and the most hurting times. And that was my life goal was to do that. And then uh, when I ran out of time because the uh, Army tells you it's time to retire, <laughs> I really didn't know what I want to do with my life. It took a few years to kind of explore that. But then the Lord started talking to me about um, writing books. And I began to hear uh, pretty much daily messages from the Lord. And uh, so I was uh, having a series of those kind of daily experiences when I started seeing a similar thing over and over. It was Sometimes it was uh, like a, as you're waking up a dream. Sometimes it was a a vision when you're just sitting down and close your eyes and you see it. I kept seeing the same thing. I saw families rushing out of their houses, loading a few uh, personal belongings into a vehicle, and they were panicky. And uh, so I was trying to understand what I was seeing. And I finally realized these people are bugging out. That's an Army term, you know, when you you grab your A-bag and you're gone. And uh, so I realized these people were bugging out. And a similar thing happened in almost all of them. All of a sudden, the whole family would sort of stop just before they got in the car to drive away. And remember, they left a baby inside the house. And it seemed, how could you possibly forget your child? But I learned later, the Lord told me what he was trying to emphasize is a lot of people 
load up like that. And one of the most critical members of the family is the Holy Spirit. And they're packing everything but the Holy Spirit. And this theme just kept playing out in different places, different groups of people, uh, different loadout things. But it pretty much came the same way every time. I didn't know what the Lord wanted me to do with that. And then one night, I, I well, I guess in the daytime, actually, I got a call from one of the ministry board mem- members, Jim Lamb. And he, he said to me, you know, this may sound strange to you, but I have been sensing all day the Lord wants you to write a book on prepping for the last days. Well, I didn't get really enthusiastic about that. <laughs> I didn't really feel the presence of the Lord and what he said. And then I told my wife about it, and she said, you know, I've been getting the same message. And I'm saying, "Uh uh-oh, now the boss has got it. So uh, I still was really reluctant because I just don't like a lot of the books and magazines I've seen about prepping for the last days. There's so much fear and so much, uh, you know, the conspiracy theories and so many things that to me were kind of unpleasant. And so I really wasn't, still wasn't interested in doing it. And right after midnight that night, I woke up with a horrible headache. I mean, it wasn't like here or here. It was everywhere. My whole head was hurting. And I got up, went into my office, sat down at the computer, uh, hoping that the headache would soon go away. And in the next two hours, I got a download from the Lord for the book. And uh, the uh, the things that I needed to be writing about, things I needed to be doing. See, I didn't want to have a book that caused people to be afraid. I wanted to, to write a book that helped people to trust the Lord and be comfortable and, and believe in the best of things. I didn't want to have about storing up self-defense things and food and all of that. There, there are plenty of materials already out about that. So I was asking the Lord, what is it you really want me to do with this book? Now, here's the funny thing that from that title, and even if you've looked at the book, you may not grab it right away, but the main thing is evangelism. That the Lord is calling the lost and releasing a kind of sense of urgency to his people to reach out to the lost, to bring them in while there's still time. That may not be that the end of the world is going to happen next week, but the end of the world is going to happen for some people by next week. And we, as the body of Christ, need to be reaching out to them. And we can't, I think we don't do that well because we don't sense the urgency. We don't have that urgent spirit. I think the disciples struggle with that. And that's why Jesus taught so much about staying alert, you know, feeling the passion for that, being ready to go, be ready at any minute. And then he said, I don't even know when it's coming. Father hasn't told me yet, but you need to be ready right now. And I read in John, the first letter, he said, this is the last hour. And I thought, man, if it's the last hour when John wrote that, what time is it now? And I began to feel a sense of urgency in my own spirit. And so the main thing I wanted to do as the Lord guided me to write this book was to get that sense of urgency out of my inside and get it out to other people. And that was the main thing that I was working on. And what I saw that I think people need more than um, adding up more dried foods. That's okay. I I have some of my own. I I don't criticize that. But I wanted to build up mental toughness and spiritual resilience. And when you think of the storehouse, think of the spiritual storehouse, not just the physical storehouse. What do we need to be storing up in terms of spiritual things to be ready for whatever Jesus calls us to do? And then to learn how to work together. I think one of the failures of the church through the centuries has been they have a greater tendency to get into rivalry and uh, uh, attack one another rather than really organizing together and going out and taking the territory for the Lord. So I believe that those are the four things that the Lord was really pressing on my heart. And that's what I tried to, to make clear in the book. But it's a motivation. We need to. Get out there and be concerned about the lost. We we didn't, don't know when the end is coming, but that person may not live live out this week, and uh, it will be too late for them unless someone has the spiritual strength and the maturity 
and all to reach out and say, I really feel a need. I want to tell you about Jesus. And, and I want to tell you that because I love you. Well, I think that's a helpful perspective to frame it within, because even though it's not necessarily the end times or the last days today or next week, it could be, for somebody, it is their last days, you know, every, every single day. And so that's that's a helpful reminder, a helpful perspective there. Um, I want to pull on a couple of threads yet from your your origin story. Um, in terms of, you uh, you said you'd experienced dreams and visions as a kid. Like, I'm, I'm curious, when did those start? And like, how did you process those? Did you know they were from the Lord? Because, uh, you know, I, I encounter a lot of seer and prophetic folks who, you know, they, they were seeing things from a very early age, and, and some people grew up in families where they, they knew what to do with that, and they ca- talked about it, and they actually encouraged it. And I know other people who grew up in families were like, we have no idea what to do with this. I'm curious for you, when did that start, and how did, how did you or your family learn to process that? Well, I'm, uh, we didn't learn to process it that well. Okay. <laughs> uh, I had my first uh, visit to heaven when I was three years old. And I still remember it. And some scenes are crystal clear in my mind. And I I went to that very special place and I felt such a deep sense of shalom. The glory of God was there and the presence of God had no worry, no fear, no anxiety. And I just felt so at home. And so I remember that when I was three years old, Um, that when I tried to tell about that, people assumed that I was lying, that I made this up. Or that I had uh, converted a dream into thinking I had a, a visitation. So it was not well received. And in fact, sometimes I was punished for saying things. So I st- sort of held that in. Then when I was four years old and my family, I think they were believers, but they didn't really have an association with the church to speak of. And um, when I was four years old, I had a, I called it a vision dream because I was sort of half awake, half asleep in my room and I was very, very aware of the room, but I suddenly was seeing like an open vision and there was a huge uh, boat and there was a ramp. There was this old guy standing by the door and these animals were coming in and they were coming in two by two. Now I didn't go to church at that time. I wasn't trained in Sunday school. I had no clue what that was all about, but I was standing there watching and it was so fascinating. But when the big cats came, the lions and the tigers, I freaked out. So as a little kid, I screamed. And in screaming, I woke up my sister and some others. So that was not well received by the family. (laughs) So I learned to just kind of keep my mouth shut about these things. And I had many times when I, I told it earlier about believing that I was from another place and my father was the king and my brother was this mighty prince warrior that I was actually seeing those things, not just something I sort of believed in my heart, but I was actually having visions about these things way before I was six years old. And so I started that way, but I really didn't get um, blessed or trained or helped or mentored by anyone around those things. So I, I pretty much kept it quiet and kept it to myself. And later in life, I would get messages, you know, that would tell me to, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, go somewhere to help somebody. And I would go there and there was actually somebody there in danger. They were out in the cold with no coat, car stalled. This was one of the events. And I picked the guy up and I asked him where he lived and he told me and I started driving there. And he said, wait a minute, you were going the other way. Where were you going? And I said, I was coming to get you. The Lord sent me. So I was having experiences like that. And even in the military as a chaplain, um, I was having uh, like words of knowledge for people on the other side of the globe and would get messages to them to try to help them in some way. So that's that's kind of the way things developed for me. And in in terms of uh, a call to ministry you talked about, I think you said you were 25. Uh, when God asks you to make a decision, choose a direction, if you will, um, had you sensed any calling to ministry in your, you know, your early age, teenage years, in, in your early adult life? When when did you sense or feel that call? I want to I tell you, I was so shy during those years. 
And I felt like I was different from everyone else on the planet because I was seeing these things, experiencing these things. And the greatest fear that I had was speaking in front of people. And I, uh, I think I felt some urgings, but I continuously prayed, Lord, please don't call me. That's a dangerous <laughs> prayer. God will often give you the thing you say, no, not that, Lord, because we need him to do it. I think that's why he does it for us. Yeah, he, he did that for me in several different areas. The things that I, I said to the Lord, I do not ever want to write a book. And I used to tell this people all the time, I don't like writing. I don't think there's any book that I need to share with other people. And the Lord said, here's what I want you to do. Write a book. <laughs> so the Lord answers the prayers, but not always the way we expect or hope. And uh, so that was a calling of the Lord on me to to do that. And then after I um, retired from the military, uh, the Lord just really kind of expanded our ministry around the world. And the books that he was having me to write actually were the things that opened the doors for ministry in uh, in the nations and across the U.S. And um, so just being faithful to him to, to tell uh, what he wants me to tell and to whom he wants me to tell it. Very often I have significant experiences and they're only for one person. Sure. And that's beautiful. If if the Lord uses you to help one person, that's enough. He'll he reward Dayunu, it's enough. Uh, I want to pull on one of the things you share from the visions that contribute to the message in this book, um, and that is uh, your vision of the enemy attempting to block or obscure the open heaven that, that's available to believers. I thought that was an, a really intriguing part of what you share in the book. Yeah, I was. Um, this has happened to me in different ways, a similar kind of thing. I feel like in the spirit, I'm lifted up, and I feel like I'm high up in the air, and the earth is far, far away. And when I look up, I see uh, like portals open. I call them portals. They're most of them are round. I've only had a few that were actually looked like doors, and most of them look like portholes, but they were portals opened up. And uh, sometimes I get to go through those and visit heaven. Sometimes I'm kind of stuck in them, and I receive something from heaven. But this day, I was not able to get to the portals. And uh, suddenly, these dark clouds began to cover the portals. And right away, I understood that that was the enemy trying to block the portal. At first, I thought he was trying to block so the portal couldn't be used. But then I came to realize he was only blocking my perception of the portal being closed. And by my faith and calling out to the Lord for help, I was able to to have those clouds removed. And uh, what I was experiencing as this was happening was the Lord was saying to me, these are not portals for you to go through. These are portals for prayers to go through, to come up into heaven. And um, I'm thinking the enemy cannot, surely cannot block our prayers. And the outcome of the vision was the Lord was confirming that, that even if you can't see it, even if your situation is so dark, so dire, so seemingly hopeless that it feels like my prayers are not getting through. Have no fear. The prayers are getting through. The Lord is not stopped by the enemy. Satan does not have any power, authority, or strength over the Lord. And when we lift our prayers up, we may not know how they go, but we can rest assured that the Father hears the prayers of his beloved children. And in his favor, he will answer those prayers, even if we can't see or if we doubt. I, I get a lot of email from people saying, you know, that they they really doubt that God's listening to them anymore. They doubt that he really hears their prayers because of some mistake they made or something they should have done they didn't do. There are all kinds of things behind that. But the consistent thing is, I don't think God can hear me. Well, this reassured me, God can hear you. God does hear you. And God is ready to act on your behalf. So like I experienced in the vision, the main thing is for us to get filled up with faith so that we drive the clouds away. And they didn't stop the prayers. 
but now we actually can. Um, I actually saw prayers. Now, in the spiritual realm, we're not limited like we are in this natural realm. So I actually saw hundreds of prayers going up through the portals. There were several portals and hundreds of prayers were going up to the Lord. So just to assure people, the enemy does not block what the Lord has planned for you. I think for this next part of the conversation, James, I'd like to focus on uh, some of the material you cover in the book related to establishing spiritual strength, growing in spiritual strength. Uh, We're recording this in October of 2020. Uh, to say the least, it's been a weird season for many of us, uh, but I, f- I feel like people have just been ground down. Like, they're, people are at a, at a uh, they're kind of feeling stuck, um, they're tired, they're weary, um, and all of our patterns have been disrupted in a major way. So uh, many, many times, I feel like, you know, if people had rhythms and routines, even even with prayer and Bible reading and being with the Lord, I feel like many have just gotten off that train, so to speak, because, uh, yeah, just stress, pressure, all the craziness. And so, uh, you know, as you think of the seasons we've been in and as you look ahead into 2021, what would be some helpful kind of principles, rhythms that we can all press into for, I would say, even in so- to some degree, reestablishing our spiritual strength? Yes. Well, the, the most important thing that stood out to me from the Lord was to avoid offense, that people are so easily offended in this generation. And as the Lord talks about, and, and Paul talks about the decline in the in the in our religious communities, our spiritual uh, unions, they begin with offense. And after the offense, their people are open for all these negative things to come in, for false teaching, false prophets, all of these things coming. So one of the main things is to avoid offense. And I don't know of a time in history when we have had more people so easily offended than we have in the last three or four years that people will just, uh, they get offended at any and everything. They get offended at lies and false, false things. And uh, they uh, rebel against the country. They rebel against their local communities. They rebel against God out of that offense. And what we need to do if we're going to be spiritually strong, first thing we need to do is get a, get a handle on that emotion in ourselves. Stop being offended. And when you feel yourself being offended, have some method by which you can reassure yourself. And and even Jesus, you know, once said, blessed is he who is not offended by me. And we see today there are people all over the globe who are offended, even just the mention of the name Jesus. And so those kind of prophecies that we're seeing, I think, coming more strongly now than we've ever seen before. And we as a body and we as individuals need to absolutely stop this tendency. And we even coined a phrase for this during this last uh, three and a half years or so, uh, calling people snowflakes, because every time a little heat comes along, they melt down. And we're just seeing all over the place, people are melting down over everything before they even know the facts they've already melted down. And it's time for us as the body of Christ to begin to become a stabilizing influence, a stabilizing force to encourage people and show them this is how you avoid offense. And I had a I don't think we have time here to talk about it, but I got translated once (laughs) into the battle of the last days and I got killed instantly. Let's make time for that, James. Go for it. (laughs) And. uh, I got translated, and I was uh, believing that I was going to meet Peter. I don't know where that came from, but I just knew I was, and I met him. He didn't say a word. He handed me the ugliest sword I've ever seen. <laughs> he looked like some farmer with no skills grabbed some stuff out of the barn and put together a sword. You know, <laughs> And he pointed to this ramp up, and I went up the ramp, and there was screaming, yelling, and that was a horrible battle. And blood was splashing over, and I was uh, trying to climb on the blood-covered stones. It was slick and everything. And at the top, Jesus was there, and he put his hand on my shoulder and sent me into the battle. And I'd like to say I lasted about a nanosecond. And I was suddenly in this room, and I was laying down on a, on a big rock. And the room was cool. It was, it was great. I felt perfect. I had no pain. Everything was wonderful. There were these stained glass windows around in the room and even some flowers there. 
And I thought, well, I'm going to get up and look at those. And then I realized I couldn't move. I was dead. And so as this reality began to set in that I was dead, but I was still there. And it went on and on and on. And I'm thinking, how long am I going to be here? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm dead. (laughs) I'm going to be here till Jesus comes (laughs) kind of thing. And suddenly the door behind me opened. And I was quickened. The light came in and I was quickened. I turned around and put my legs over the side of the stone that I was laying on. And I saw Jesus standing in the door. And Jesus behind him, I could see this white robed army, horses, white, beautiful horses, two by two with saints and angels on the horses. And Jesus said, looked at me and said, are you ready to ride? And I, I am ready to ride. <laughs> so I, it's a whole lot better than laying on that stone, right? So I got up and I, I, I walked over and Jesus showed me one horse that didn't have a rider. And he pointed me toward that horse. I got over the horse and I grabbed the, the bridle and the saddle and boom, I was not there anymore. I was gone. But the takeaway from that was I died with him. I was raised with him. How, how can I be offended? I'm a dead man. How can you offend me if I'm dead? So I have died with Christ. So offense no longer affects me. So that's kind of my way. I go back to that experience and I say, you can't offend me because I died and I'm alive in Christ. But we all need to find a way to stop being so easily offended. And I just pray the Lord will release some kind of word or vision or dream for people that are listening to this, that they would um, also have an experience that reminds them so they don't have to live under offense anymore. One of the great things in this age, I think, is there's so much darkness and deception And sometimes I just wonder, is anybody telling the truth? (laughs) And sometimes I just don't listen to things over the media because you can't sort through what's true, what's false. It just everything is all mixed up. And I don't want to do that. So I want to be able to um, get over the deception. And I think the key to that is that um, uh, Paul says that the Holy Spirit gives a gift of discerning of spirits. And I think we probably need that gift now more than ever in history. And so I'm praying for me and for you and for everyone else that the Lord will give us a spiritual gift of discerning of spirit so that we cannot be um, led astray. We won't live in delusion or deception, but we will see the truth in the Holy Spirit and that we will be able to be freed and become mentally strong because we're free from that deception. Jesus said, stay alert over and over and over again. I think this is one of the keys. Stay alert. So people have a hard time doing that. Now, in the military, we have a special way of learning about that. It's called guard duty. And every soldier who's ever been on guard duty knows it's virtually impossible to stay awake and alert two hours even. They used to have people stay on alert, on uh, guard duty for six, four, six hours. They had to quit that because nobody stays awake for four to six hours in the middle of the night out in the middle of nowhere. They fall asleep. And so we saw it. There were so many stories in the military. You know, this one uh, soldier said he practiced and practiced and practiced that uh, when the sergeant of the guard woke him up, the first thing he would say was amen and say, oh, hi, Sarge, I was just praying. <laughs> Uh, and he actually did it. He came to my office to tell me he had finally succeeded when he, the guard, Sergeant the Guard woke him up. He said, Amen. And Sergeant the Guard talked to me later that day and said, What can I do? I can't prove he was asleep. <laughs> Maybe he was praying. So we let him go. But it, over and over, there are stories in the military about people falling asleep on guard duty. Yeah, we had a, a young soldier that um, he had his M16. And like Barney Fife, they gave him one bullet. <laughs> and it was in his shirt pocket, just like the, the TV show. So he uh, was out and he was guarding the ammo dump and he saw a rabbit. And without thinking, he got that bullet out, put it in his M16 and shot the rabbit in the middle of the ammo dump. And MPs came from everywhere <laughs> to uh, get that guy. But for him, that's how he stayed awake was he was hunting when he was on the guard duty job. So how do we stay alert? When Jesus needed prayer 
the most from his disciples, they fell asleep. Not once, but three times they fell asleep. And he let them know it's not just for him that they need to stay alert. They need to stay alert unless lest they fall into temptation. So I think all of us need that. How do we stay alert when we, we've heard about the end times all of our lives and people kind of give up? They're not really looking anymore. We're not staying alert. We're not staying awake. We're not being on watch with Jesus. And we just need to get back to that. And part of being mentally tough is developing the skills to stay alert even when nothing is happening. So the Lord just kept pointing out things that we need to do. And one of the things that he told me was um, to um, tell people to quit getting caught up in conspiracy theories. (laughs) And even in the Bible, it says don't call everything a conspiracy that people call a conspiracy. And so the word has been there, but a lot of us have kind of ignored that. And a little thing will happen, and all of a sudden these people are all out with all these conspiracy theories. And the problem with them is there's a little truth mixed with some falsehood. And when there's a little bit of falsehood, it's all false. So for us to stay clear and move the Holy Spirit, to stay mentally tough, we need to avoid getting caught up in those conspiracy theories. And that those are the ways for us, I think, to the main ways for us to stay mentally tough. And to stay uh, spiritually resilient, uh, it's interesting. The first thing the Lord told me was people need to travel light. You're carrying too much baggage. You need to let go of some of this junk that you're carrying around, old hurts, old offenses, um, old losses. And people just keep dragging these things around. And so the Lord gave me this vision. I was climbing up this really beautiful mountain. And I was on this road that was um, a dirt surface, so it was very smooth and it was comfortable to walk. There was a nice breeze coming down, and I was enjoying the breeze. And suddenly there was a barrier across the road and a sign there that said, leave all baggage here. And I, I didn't think I had any baggage. So I prayed to the Holy Spirit, let me know the baggage that I'm carrying, especially the baggage I'm not aware of right now. And I really got a download from the Holy Spirit. I left that stuff at that place and the barrier was lifted and I continued my journey upward. And I think that this is one of the things that we need to do is lighten the load, get over some of these old things. I like um, used to hear the pastor who always said, get over yourself. And I was in heaven one day, and I was um, not responding in the most honorable ways with the Lord. (laughs) Sorry, that's my nature. And anyway, the Lord said, you know what you need is to get over yourself. And uh, I didn't get offended by that. I took that to heart. This This is a real message. This is a powerful message for me. Get over myself and get focused on Jesus. And I believe that in this season, if we're going to be spiritually strong, spiritually resilient, we need to get over ourselves and really get connected, focused on Jesus. Amen. And a thing that followed on that that was similar to that was uh, forget the things that are past. And it says that, you know, Paul teaches about that, forgetting what is behind. We keep our eyes focused. And in this season, we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And that's how we're going to stay spiritually strong. Get our eyes focused on the moves of the Holy Spirit. Move when he moves and stop when he stops. In the season, get spiritually resilient. Well, James, you've given us many actionable takeaways throughout our conversation today. It's almost time for us to go. But before we wrap up, I would love for you to take a few moments to pray for the viewers and listeners. Would you do that for us? Okay. Uh, I like to pray uh, this way. The priestly <laughs> blessing. You may pray however you like, sir. (laughs) Okay. Because the Lord said, this is how you bless my people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and establish for you shalom. And I'm praying that you will receive seven bold shalom, shalom in every area of your life, that the Lord will open your spiritual eyes to see, open your spiritual ears to hear. Open your spiritual heart to perceive the things of the kingdom 
and to know what it is, to be as wise as the sons of Issachar, to understand the times, and to know what the Lord's people should be doing. And I'm praying that each and every person hearing this will experience that spiritual awakening and the freedom that the Lord can bring by releasing these gifts. Pray it in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you so much for that, James. And for the listeners, the viewers who'd like to connect with you, find out more about your ministry, your resources, where can we find you on the web? Okay. I'm sorry I have a very long name. <laughs> but it's Higher Calling Ministries, I-N-T-L dot com. And that's our website. And like we do with every episode, we'll make it easy. We'll put detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with James and pick up your very own copy of the new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with James Durham. Once again, our book today was Alert, Perilous Times, A Prepper's Guide to the Last Days. Again, if you want to connect with James and find out more, a great place to start is his website. It's a long one, but I'm going to give it one more time to make sure you got it. It is HigherCallingMinistriesintl.com. And James, I just want to say thank you so much for pouring into us and encouraging us today. It was really a blessing. Thank you. It's a blessing to be with you.